Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. Our church's vision is to have a passion for God and compassion for people. We hope that the teachings in this podcast will encourage you as you seek to follow Christ and grow in your faith. Now, let's get into today's message. Well, good morning and happy Easter, Ritman Grace Brethren Church. My name is Clark. I'm the pastor here. And if we haven't met yet, I'd love to meet you and I'd love to meet your family after service. So feel free to stick around here. Uh, it'd be great to meet you, get to know you a little bit. And if I do know you, I'd love to just catch up with you and uh, make you late for your uh, Easter lunch. That'd be great. So um, as Dwayne mentioned earlier during the uh, announcements, feel free to make your way to wel- the welcome desk right outside those doors. If you're a first time guest with us, uh, we have a gift for you. Uh, That's just our way of saying thanks for being here. You uh, could have slept in today. You could have uh, stayed at home and played Nintendo Wii. You could have done a lot of stuff, but you decided to come here and be here and hear about the resurrection of Jesus. So uh, great for you. Uh, But seriously, we'd love to just give you that gift, just our way of saying thanks for being here. It's an honor and a privilege to have you with us. So it is Easter Sunday, and the downside of being a preacher on Easter Sunday, can you guess? It is that you guys already know what the sermon is going to be about. There's no punchline this morning. There's no, oh, I wonder what he's going to say. Here's what we're going to say. Jesus rose from the dead, right? So let me pray, and the band's going to come back up and play. We're all going to go home, have some deviled eggs, right? No. Some of you would be like, awesome, let's do it. Uh, so Jesus rose from the dead. So that's, that's the message. Uh, but here's what I want to do this morning. I want to take a look at how the resurrection changes the future. Because I think it's common on Easter Sunday that we look back at the resurrection and we embrace the truth that Jesus in time and in space and in history got up out of the grave. And that's good. That's true. That's right. We should honor that. We should celebrate that. But we also ought to ask the question, how does this change the future? The fact that the resurrection happened, what difference does that make for where things are going? So that's the thing that I'd like us to think about for a few minutes together. The reality is the resurrection is a reorientation. It's a reorientation. The resurrection of Jesus actually reorients us. It changes our trajectory and it gives us a different way of being in the world. And that's what I want to think about with you for a few moments, a few moments this morning. Uh, to do that, I want us to look at a passage that was read a little bit earlier uh, during our scripture reading, and it's found in the New Testament in the book of Acts, chapter 17. Uh, if you want to use the Bibles and the chairs you're sitting in, you'll be able to follow along on page 786, because we're going to break in uh, down at verse 29. Uh, If you want to grab your Bibles and turn there, if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the words up on the screen for you as well. But Acts chapter 17, and as we're turning there, let me set the stage a little bit. We're just looking at three verses at the very end of a sermon that the Apostle Paul uh, preaches in the city of Athens. Uh, The Apostle Paul, by the way, is someone who was totally transformed by Jesus, and he loved Jesus. He planted churches and was on mission for Jesus, in case you don't know who the Apostle Paul is. And so, at this point in the New Testament church, Paul's preaching in this city called Athens. And so here's what's happening. In the city of Athens, there's many people who are skeptical of the idea of resurrection. And there's a lot of people who don't really understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what the Apostle Paul is doing is he is preaching to them a message about the good news of Jesus. And I want us to pay attention specifically to how he locates the resurrection in that sermon and in the case that he makes from the resurrection in that sermon. So Acts chapter 17, hopefully we're there by now. We're going to break in at verse 29. It says this, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. 
For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So what I'd like us to do this morning is to follow the logic of this passage. And in order to do that, we're actually going to start at the end and we're going to uh, work backwards. And why would we do that? Well, it's because at the end is where we have the connection to the resurrection. So notice what it says here in verse 31. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So there's our reference to the resurrection. The Apostle Paul says, here's the resurrection. God raised Jesus from the dead. And he says, in doing that, God has given us assurance of something. God is giving us proof of something. God is testifying to the certainty of something. And what is that something? As we back up a little bit, we see that something. In verse 31, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And so what the resurrection has given us assurance of is that God has fixed a day which he will judge the world with justice through this man Jesus who he raised from the dead. And so there's your future focus, your future orientation. Paul says, here's what we know. Because Jesus got up out of the grave, we know that God has fixed a day on which he is going to judge the world with justice. Sometimes we hear references to judgment or final judgment, and we feel that as condemnation. And it will be for many people. But listen, here's what the message of the text is. It's that God is judging the world by justice. In other words, all unrighteousness, all injustice, all sin, all selfishness, all brokenness is going to be reckoned for on that day. There's going to come a day where all wrongs will be made right. When all, all things that are broken will be restored. When all that's fallen apart and fragmented will be made whole again. That's the day that Paul's talking about. That's the day that God is going to judge the world in righteousness and justice through Jesus. And he's saying the resurrection proves that. The resurrection is the down payment that that day is on God's calendar. And this is the good news that we're going to get to here pretty soon. Notice what the rest of the text tells us in light of the resurrection that that day is going to happen. There's two ways that we can live in response to that. And verse 30 says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. So you might say it this way. There's two ways of living in light of this reality. We can live in ignorance or we can live in repentance. To live in ignorance means to ignore the resurrection of Jesus. To ignore the fact that God has fixed a day on which He's going to judge the world. We can live as though we're just going to ignore those realities and go on doing what we're doing, but that's not what Paul longs for us, and that's not what the Holy Spirit longs for us. The reason that this is in the Bible, the reason that this message was preached is because God commands all people everywhere to repent. That God invites us, rather than ignoring this, God invites us to repentance. And listen, repentance is one of those Words that can sound weighty and it can sound religious and heavy, but for our purposes this morning, I want you to think of repentance as a reorientation. This is inviting us to see that we can live in ignorance of these things, or we can reorient our life in accordance with these things. We can turn our lives in a direction that recognizes the resurrection of Jesus. And what that resurrection means for what God is doing now and into the future. And we can choose to align our lives with that through faith in Jesus. That's what repentance is. Repentance means acknowledging that these things are true and that changes how I live in the world for the sake of making this tangible. Think of your life as an arrow. All of us live our lives pointed in some direction. We are teleological creatures. We live with some end in mind. There's some target that our lives 
are aimed at. There's some goal towards which we are all striving. There's some end that's in mind that we want to be directed towards. And Paul says, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, if you're living in light of the resurrection, it means that your life is aimed at that day. The day that God is going to judge the world in justice through Jesus. That's what your life is pointed at. And that's what you're oriented towards. You're not living for next week. You're not living for next month. You're not living for next year. You're not living for a target a couple years into the future where you want your life to look a certain way. You are living pointed at this day that is to come when God will judge the world with justice through the Lord Jesus. Your life as a disciple of Jesus ought to be pointed and oriented toward that day. And what that means is that the resurrection of Jesus reorients our lives. And here's the reality. For some of us here this morning, we have not reoriented our lives towards that day. And that's God's invitation to you this morning. But if you are a follower of Jesus here this morning, this is what this means for you. It means that your life is lived for something beyond the right now. There's two ways in which the resurrection of Jesus reorients our lives. That day that God has fixed in which He will judge the world through Jesus reorients us in a couple different ways. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The first way the resurrection reorients our lives is it reorients our love. It reorients our love. As human beings, we are made to love. We are loving creatures. In other words, we are made to pour ourselves out towards someone or something. In other words, we are made to have affection. We're made to love and have a longing for someone or something. We cannot not love. The problem with us is that we love the wrong things. Our loves are disordered. They're fragmented. And so instead of loving what we ought to, we love all kinds of other lesser things. Can't you see that to be true in your own life? Can't you see your love being poured out and toward things that cannot sustain the weight of that love or that you don't, they don't love you back the way that they're meant to? What that day gives us is a better object of love. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself. The One who died, the One who rose from death, and He's the one who is standing there on that day judging the world. He's the one who invites us to love Him. He's the one we're meant to be loving and seeking after and delighting in. And we need to realize that Jesus is worthy of our love because He is the only one, the only one who loved us when we were unlovable. The crazy thing about disordered love is that it destroys us. When our loves are disordered and in disarray in our lives, they pull us into despair, they pull us into discouragement, they pull us into confusion, into selfishness. It's our disordered loves that are most of the problem, most of our problem with the human condition. But you see, the Bible says, while we were still sinners, in other words, while our loves were disordered and discombobulated, Jesus loved us. Us. God loved us, loved us, the scriptures say, sent his son to go to the cross in our place, bearing the weight, bearing the curse of all our disordered loves. Think about it this way all of the things that you love too much are what put Jesus on the cross. Your love of control put Jesus on the cross. Your love of power. Put Jesus on the cross. Your love of pleasure. Put Jesus on the cross. Your love of self. Put Jesus on the cross. Your love of food, money, sex, success. Put Jesus on the cross. All the disordered things that we chase after, that's what Jesus was dying for. And yet, while we were still chasing after those things, because He loved you and me enough to die, to bear the curse, the weight, the penalty, of our disordered loves. And here's what the resurrection says. The resurrection says, not only did He die to pay the penalty for those things, He took them down into the grave and He left them there. 
And He freed you from all the disordered loves and the ways that they play with your life, they mess with you, they bring you down, so that now by establishing Himself as the one who has love for you, He reorients your love. He gives you a new object of affection. As you see His love for you, it starts to warm your heart. You turn in trust and in love and in hope in Jesus Christ. He's the one that you love more than anything else. And by your love being oriented towards Him and His kingdom, guess what happens? Your life begins to be pulled more and more and more in that direction. And you begin to see things differently. You begin to love the right things because you love the right person. See how that works? When we love Jesus, we love the things that Jesus loves. When we don't love Jesus, we love all kinds of other things that we're not made to love. And they can't bear the weight of our love in the first place. Jesus reorients our loves. And that's why those of us who have been changed by the resurrection, their love is oriented towards that day. Towards the Jesus that stands on that day to judge the whole world. And we're not afraid of that day. Why can we say that? Because it's His love that took our sin into the grave and left it there. And so we know that the judgment that we'll face on that last day for followers of Christ has already been executed on the Lord Jesus and there's nothing waiting for us but a welcome into His heavenly kingdom. That day reorients our lives. It reorients our loves. And this is all throughout the New Testament. If you're starting to read the Bible, if you're starting to uh, read the Bible, pay attention to how the writers of the Bible, the disciples of the Bible, express their love for the Lord Jesus. And you'll notice that there's a desire to please Him and to be pleasing to Him on that last day and their love for Him. And just consider what the Apostle Paul says and at the end of 2 Timothy, the last letter that we have from the Apostle Paul as he is on his way to his own death. Scripture says this, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. So here's the point. If I'm a follower of Jesus, if I'm a Christ follower, here's what I'm living for. Ready? I'm loving Christ. I'm loving His appearing. I'm living for that day. And that changes what I do in the right here and right now. And if you've been changed by the resurrection, that's true of your life also. Your love is reoriented towards Jesus, reoriented towards His kingdom, His purposes. Not only does that day reorient our love, but it also reorients our longings. It reorients our longings. The resurrection reorients our longings. One of the most profound realities of being human is that you have longings, right? You have desires. You have aches in your soul. You have things that you want and long to experience. And it's those longings and sometimes unfulfilled longings that drive us into all kinds of selfishness. Because the world around us wants to tell us that those longings that you have you can have them fulfilled right here and right now. That there's an answer to those longings in the world. That's what our culture wants you to believe. And I wonder if you've tried that long enough to figure out that no matter how much you try to fill those longings with the stuff that you can get for yourself, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take that longing that you fill away. It still doesn't fill that ache. It doesn't answer the empty void that's in your soul. And do you know why that is? It's because those longings are not longings for this world. Those longings and those aches and those empty desires that you have are pointing towards something that cannot be fulfilled in this world. They're pointing you towards the transcendent, the eternal, the thing that you were really made for. The Bible says that as a human being, you are made in the image of God. Do you have any idea what that means? 
It means that you are made to experience and to know eternity. It's an eternal longing. It's a transcendent longing that only God's kingdom can actually fulfill. And that day reorients our longings because it shows us, it reminds us that the things that we long for cannot and will not be fulfilled here. So we're holding out hope for the day when they will be. The day, that day when Jesus promises to answer our deepest longings, to fulfill our deepest aches for meaning, for significance, for communion. Our longings to be known and to have deep fellowship and communion with people and to ultimately have communion with God. Those longings point us to that day and to his kingdom. And so when we live in light of the resurrection, it orients our longings. And you know what that does? It defeats our propensity to seek after fulfilling longings in the here and now. When we begin to realize, wow, you know what? These longings are about that day. These longings are, they're actually about his kingdom. These longings are pointing me in that direction, towards glory and heaven and the kingdom of God, towards the new heaven and the new earth. And when I realize that that's where my longings are actually pointing me, I can basically be like, why would I expect to be fulfilled right here? Why would I expect to be fulfilled right here and right now? If I'm a follower of Jesus, I need to remember that I am an exile. I'm a stranger. You know what I am? I'm a temporary traveler here in this world. There is another world coming. There is a new heavens. There is a new earth. There is a new city in which righteousness dwells. And that's what I'm made for. The book of Hebrews reminds us that even in the Old Testament, even the Old Testament saints during that era, before the resurrection, before Jesus came, and as it were, given the down payment on the new life that is to come for us, even the saints that lived before that, the Bible says, they knew this. That they were hoping, too, for a future day. Though that day was a lot more uh, shadowy for them than it is for us, they had less clarity, they had less assurance of what that would look like because they did not have the experience of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and yet they had God's promises. But look at what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 11 about these Old Testament saints. It says this, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, in other words, if they believed that their longing which should be fulfilled in this world, they would have the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has a prepared a city for them. And here's the really good news. Ready? He has prepared for us a city. The resurrection of Jesus is the down payment, the proof of assurance that that day is coming, that that city is coming, that the new heavens and the new earth are coming. And therefore, that reorients our existence in this world. We live differently in the world right now. Not just because the resurrection happened in the past, but because of what the resurrection tells us about the future. And therefore, as Christians, we live in what's called the already but not yet. We live in the already, but not yet. In between the resurrection of Jesus and that day, that day that is to come. And we live our lives tethered to those two points. The day Jesus rose from the dead and the day in which God will judge the world through the person of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is a reorientation. And so the question the text puts before us this morning the question that we need to wrestle to the ground is this. Have you been reoriented because of the resurrection of Jesus? Have you been reoriented because of the resurrection of Jesus? Has your life been reset on a new course because of the resurrection of Jesus? 
there's two possible answers to that question. The first one is yes, and I want to be even more. I need to be reminded of that. I need to be connected to that day and to always be recalibrating my life to yes and more. The other possible answer to that question is no, I have not been reoriented to that yet. And I have not anchored and tethered my life to those two realities. And if that's the camp that you're in this morning, this text is inviting you to move towards repentance. That is to reorient your life. Right now, this morning, for some of you, the first time, God is commanding and inviting you to anchor your life in these realities. To recognize that Jesus' resurrection tells us what's coming in the future and what it means to live intelligently in the in-between. To live in light of that resurrection and in light of that future day. And that means you need a Savior. And His name's Jesus. You need one that pays the penalty for your sin and secures your judgment on that day so that what you experience on that day is not punishment and it's not penalty for your sin or your selfishness or your disordered loves, but rather you experience the welcome of Jesus because He bore the punishment for your sin and your disordered loves. So the invitation is open to you this morning. And as long as this world continues... As long as that day hasn't come yet, as long as there's preachers of the gospel and Christians around you, the invitation has come. Reorient your life around Jesus. Reorient your life around the resurrected one who is also the judge of all the earth who is to come. That invitation, that invitation is open to you this morning. And I just encourage you, like Dwayne was saying earlier, if you fill out one of those Connect cards, let us know if you want to talk to somebody, if you need prayer. We would love to get together with you for a cup of coffee and talk about these things, pray with you about them. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Well, God, we humble ourselves this morning under your word. And Lord, we thank you that you have fixed a day in which you will judge the world with justice through the person, the man, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that that day is sure, that that day is certain. And the reason we know that is because Jesus got up out of the grave. God, thank you that the resurrection is not merely something in the past, but something that orients us in the present and that determines the future. Jesus, we acknowledge our need to be oriented to that story. God, would you anchor us and center us in that story? I ask that you would bring us to our knees in gratitude for the Lord Jesus. We pray all these things for our good, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our church's mission is to follow God, share His truth, and be examples of the love of Jesus to all. If you would like to know more about us, you can visit our website at www.ritmangrace.org or drop by anytime for one of our in-person Sunday morning worship services. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast.